As a bank that focuses on business, we work with business leaders all day, every day. We have a front row seat to what's working and what has potential. The First Business Bank podcast is dedicated to sharing insights to help you work better, smarter, and faster to achieve your goals. Let's get into the show. Welcome to another First Business Bank podcast. I'm Kevin Kane, and I'll be your host for today's episode on integrated payables. This is the second in an ongoing series we'll be producing throughout 2022 on a variety of treasury management topics. Our first podcast was a general overview titled, What is Treasury Management? And so today we're going to focus on a specific solution known as integrated payables. In basic terms, you can think of integrated payables as a form of automation for your treasury function. To help us explore this topic further, I have with me today, Kim Preston and Marley Jorgensen. Would each of you take a moment to introduce yourself to our listeners? Hello, I'm Kim Preston, Senior Vice President and Director of Treasury Management at First Business Bank. Hi, I'm Marley Jorgensen and I'm a Treasury Management Officer at First Business Bank as well. Thank you, Kim. Thank you, Marley. Let's get our conversation going. I'll start with a question for you, Kim. What is integrated payables? Sure. To put it in probably basic terms, uh, it's the ability for a business client uh, from their accounting software to create a single payment file, which includes all modalities from check, ACH, wire, or in many cases, adding virtual payment to that as well, and the ability to combine all of those payment modalities into one single online portal. Okay, got it. And if we think of uh, benefits, uh, taking what you just described, what are the benefits for a business to implement this type of a solution uh, versus more traditional ways of moving money out of the company to, to other places? Um, so I'll comment on four different options. Um, one, streamlining the payment process. Again, as I said, it puts all those payment modalities into one final payment file. So it's not a case where you issue a check file and you have to do an ACH file and wires outside of that. So there's efficiencies gained from that standpoint. Uh, there's reduced costs because again, if you're eliminating checks, uh, the mailing costs, envelopes, things of that nature, um, reduce costs in labor because of the streamlining. Uh, security, there's some definite fraud mitigation um, improvements using the single payment process file, uh, as well as revenue generation opportunity. With the virtual card, you have the ability to earn revenue on payments that you're making. Okay. Got it. Marley, how about from from your point of view, uh, maybe just to build off of some of the things that uh, Kim described, are there are there thoughts that you may have about how you measure the ROI, the, re- the return on that effort to put in place an integrated payable solution? Is that something you have any insight into? Yeah, working with a couple of clients on um, the ROI piece, it's it's really interesting and very attractive to them just seeing kind of those numbers at play where certain card payments would be transferred over into rev- a revenue stream. And then also a factor in that, as Kim mentioned, um, would be kind of the time and the cost of a check. I found it really interesting. Uh, clients had mentioned their uh, analysis that they did internally on the cost of a check because industry standard is around $5, but they estimated it to be closer to $8 just based on everyone who touched it there, the lack of efficiency in their terms um, on the cost of that, postage, time, envelopes, all all those things that um, a lot of clients are used to with paying via check. So to them, um, you know, you can enter those numbers and calculate kind of, okay, theirs was, they estimated around $8 to put that in and um, see the difference that they can really, that integrated payables can really make with that virtual card piece. So not only, um, you know, is there that revenue stream, there's also that cost that they're not having to incur anymore on that, on those check payments. Ah, okay. So let me, let me, uh, I think I'm with you. So on that, um, if we're talking about, I, uh, I'll just do some round numbers. If I have a hundred checks a month and that entire end to end process, you described Marley, $8 to issue a check 
et cetera, et cetera. So that's $800 a cost. Sounds like what you're describing is moving away from checks as one uh, scenario. And instead of issuing checks or cutting checks, you're actually making those payments then with a virtual card in the example that you just shared? Yes, exactly, in some cases. Okay, and and does it have to be an all or nothing? What I mean, I guess, is um, you could go from an environment where, again, you're substituting a virtual card, so payments uh, on a card instead of, char- uh, instead of uh, issuing checks. Is there something in between? So it's maybe not all or nothing, but you move some of your payments to to the card solution in that scenario, but not all. Yes, exactly. Some still go via check, um, but the cost is still reduced since it's in that um, that pay- one payment file that it, those still get dispersed via check, but the cost is lower to the client just because they're not the ones touching it and doing all the additional resources. So there's a cost to that, but um, you know the ones that can go virtually with a virtual card, those ones go that way and those payments, I should say, go that way. So I'll piggyback a couple of comments on that as well. So part of it could be there's this kind of different conversations we can have with the client around what's the best option. You know, maybe a client that's currently doing all check for payments. You know, maybe initially some of it's starting that I'm out with ACH. Um, and then, A, we will help them uncover those uh vendors that they're paying that do accept virtual card, because not all vendors will do accept credit card. There's a component to that. So it could be just, you know, maybe it's starting out like the base level, you know, eliminating the check cost, because that's that's the biggest cost in the payment side of the equation for, for clients is the check side. Even going to ACH, they're going to have reduced cost uh, converting check payments to ACH. And then maybe the next tranche is you know, some check could go to virtual, maybe some ACH could go to virtual. So it's kind of a moving target. You know, it's, it, it doesn't, it's kind of, to your point, Kevin, it's not all or nothing at once. Um, but, you know, we'll gradually help, you know, that's up, that's part of our role to help them determine what's the best option for them too, to be the most efficient, the most secure, um, and get the best ROI for them to, uh, with the investment of the product. So Kim, uh, to build off of some of the things Marley described, when we're talking about integrated payables big picture, it starts out with that description. The discovery process, if I'm tracking with this, really begins with a conversation where you describe the the concept and maybe some of the benefits, but then you really dig in to an individual client's distribution of payment types. So could be all check is one extreme, or it could be a blend of lots of checks, maybe some ACH, some wires, and perhaps some card uh, disbursements, but really trying to understand, okay, what are you doing today and what might be possible in terms of changing the mix between those different payment types? Is that is that that kind of the, the initial step in the effort? Yes, because um, every client is not going to be the same. So we kind of use a benchmark of average of 200 payments a month perhaps that a client is making and then back into it from there and then as you talked about so it could be a client using all checks so maybe the first step would be converting to ACH um, or converting you know some to virtual because again not every every vendor um, accepts excuse me, accepts credit cards. Um, sure. So it could be, you know, we have to start with ACH. Um, the goal is each each level we get to, you know, check wire to ACH to virtual is more efficient for the client. Um, there's some better security controls in place. Um, and obviously the virtual card, which the end game is we'd love to get clients, you know, more payments going to that virtual piece because that's where the revenue is for the client, um, as well as from a secure standpoint. It's, you know, it's a single use card, so it's a one-time payment. So from a chance from fraud, um, and it's just more efficient all the way around. But again, it's it's a building block. Um, you know, it's not all or nothing from the start. So that's where, where we come into play to kind of understand, you know, how their what their processes are and how we can help improve upon them. So, Marley, Kim was describing revenue share, and some of our listeners may not be familiar with what that means in the context of uh, card spend or a virtual card. Can you give us a high-level description uh, around what that represents? 
Yeah, so it's nice when we do kind of a vendor match. Um, we run the analysis based on uh, current uh, vendors that their the client is paying, and then um, you can really see kind of what percentage would go to virtual card, and you would earn a basis point um, percentage based on that spend. So every dollar spent via card, you would get to earn a rebate on. And depending on how much it can it can change uh, versus large ticket items or how much that you are spending. Um, so it's nice that you're able to that they're able to earn that based on uh, those payments. Okay. So what I'm hearing is an easy way to think about it. It's a little bit like the commercial equivalent of reward points or rebates that a consumer might get when they're using uh, their credit card to buy groceries or whatever the case might be. Yes, that's exactly right. So you can just almost pretend that a virtual card is basically that plastic that you're paying with at a vendor um, that when you're buying something. But in this case, it's more secure because it's just a single um virtual card, if you will. And once it's used, then it's done and you get a new card the next time if you're going to pay of another vendor. Okay, terrific. So let's shift gears a little bit. Um, we talked about uh, some of the basic parameters around that discovery process. We talked about the fact that there is uh, an ROI on integrated payables that relates to shifting from one payment type to another where there are different efficiencies to be gained, more automation to the process uh, within an accounting function at a company. Um, can we talk a little bit about uh, how long has integrated payables been out there? Is it newer? Is it been around for a while? Talk a little bit about that, either one of you. It's been around for years. Um, I would say, though, as probably the probably in the last few years, it's become just more, I guess, relevant. Uh, a lot of the large institutions have had it for some time, but with advances in technology and the product, as well as more and more banks having an interest in again helping clients find efficiencies and and you know more revenue share and security and whatnot, there's more interest. So I I think that's probably why you're hearing about it more because there's just more banks getting involved with it. Okay. And that does make me think about, is there a certain, uh, so more and more banks are offering it. It's becoming more relevant for all the reasons, Kim, you touched on. Uh, how about from the company's point of view, is there a certain size of a company that is a good candidate for integrated payables? Do you have to reach a certain threshold in terms of uh, sales revenue at a company before it makes sense uh, or not? Ideally, you think a larger client, but it hasn't always turned out that way, especially when we've had certain businesses that said, we're going in right now to the office just to cut checks, or uh, we are having issues with having the person who signs checks available to do that. Uh, so it, it really just depends. And then, you know, we had another one that said, we can implement this, this process, and it actually helps um, cover kind of a full-time position that we just haven't been able to fill. So that's been really intriguing for certain clients that initially I thought, oh, they're probably not as interested in the service. Um, I mean, typically we'd say at least 150 to 200 payments a month, um, but revenue size, I, I don't really think there's a good number to put on it. I don't know. What do you think, Kim? No, I would say any client, again, it, it comes down to kind of what the client's desire is. Is it to improve efficiencies? Is it, you know, they're interested in the revenue piece? Um, so, yeah, any any type of client, um, you know, maybe a, cl a client that's only, ca you know, cash intensive, obviously, that maybe doesn't fit in that, in that wheelhouse. But, you know, any client that's issuing checks or ACH or wires or, would be a candidate for this product. Okay, terrific. And, you know, I think, again, like many of the more technical solutions that are out there, A, it's been around for a while, so it's proven. This isn't uh, some emerging solution that has not been tested. And in many cases, when new approaches are introduced to the market, it does typically start out at the, the larger end in terms of size and complexity of customers or companies. But uh, it's evident based on what the two of you have just touched on that uh, even a fairly modest level of uh, payments on a monthly basis are worthy of consideration to shift uh, to this type of a solution. So when we talk about um, 
a little bit maybe in terms of what's required within uh, a company's uh, accounting function or treasury environment uh, that would support this. So what I'm really asking about, I think, is is this kind of a plug-and-play solution, uh, different ERP systems that maybe work best? Are there any specific requirements that listeners should be aware of in order to move forward with integrated payables within their company? Good question, Kevin. And yes, you do want to be uh, kind of careful of that. Uh, a big topic, at least for a lot of clients that I'm talking with, is their ERP systems. I've had so many that have looked at new ones and kind of made the change. I don't know if COVID kind of sparked that and just um, they realized they need to um, kind of update a little bit or they're not happy with what they're currently using. So then one main item that you really want to have for integrated payables to make it um, the most cost effective and the most efficient, which is what we're we're trying to do with automation, is to be able to generate uh, one payment file with the multiple payments within there. So um, you know you want the check ACH, wire, and then v card all in one file to be able to, um, in some cases, uh, process straight through to the bank. So, that can be tricky. I know I have a client right now who's making a change and they came to us and said, um, you know, would there be one that you'd recommend that works well with integrated payables? So I would encourage anyone who is making a change in the next year or two or on their roadmap um, to definitely ask the question and kind of see where that leads them when they're evaluating. Okay. So, yep. To piggyback a little bit on that too, though, there is the ability I, I would say from through some customization. I mean, we, we have the ability to work with, I mean, there's hundreds of ERP systems that work with the product. So it, again, to Marley's point, it just, you know, some may be a little bit more archaic and they're if they're at the point of upgrading that that's, you know, something to look at. Um, another thing we did uncover through this, uh, we have a client that, or a large client and they're in multiple markets. So they have a couple of different banks, uh, but they have the ability, we can, pull files from external banks into this product into one file as well. So again, with technology, um, you know, we've got the ability to do some customization to make some of those things work too. So. Okay, terrific. And and I'm thinking about uh, a middle market company. Uh, some of those resources could be in-house IT people. Uh, it could be their accounting firm or uh, whoever they partnered with in terms of an ERP system, probably in addition to their, their banker, uh, can offer insights in how to evaluate their ability to um, generate or produce the type of file, Kim and Marley, that you've been describing, and whether there are any enhancements or modules within their ERP system that would help facilitate um, the implementation or adoption. I'll use that word. Uh, of an uh, integrated payable solution. Does that make does that make sense? Yes. And we've been talking, uh, this is kind of a Swiss Army knife in terms of lots of different payment types. Are there any payment types that will not work for this uh, integrated uh, payable solution? Well, the first one that comes to mind for me is, um, we've just heard a little bit about it lately, is um, kind of digital currency with Bitcoin. Um, that's not not available, at least not as of now. So um, that's the first one that comes to mind just because uh, we all keep hearing uh, bits and pieces about uh, the digital currency world. Yeah. yeah, that's the only one I would say at this point too. Other than I think Kim, you talked about cash, and so presumably well, yeah. that doesn't. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> stating the obvious, perhaps, but uh, yes. okay. Got it's it. funny you bring up cash and then digital currency, which could not be further um, from each other, right? But yeah, so, yes, yeah, so that you you know that's a good point. Either the stuff that's like very far advanced to your point, Marley, or the stuff that's really really old school. So those extremes won't work, but everything in between will is what I'm hearing. So. Um, you know, can we let's go back to um, uh, virtual cards for a moment? I think we've already touched on this, but it's worth revisiting. Are there what are the advantages of using virtual cards within the integrated uh, payables framework? 
Uh, I can start out. I mean, one, the revenue, obviously, that's first and foremost. Um, you're making a payment and you're making money by making a payment. So and that's kind of unheard of. Uh, the efficiency from that standpoint, uh, security, because it's a single card use payment, um, and just it's more efficient. So the one caveat with the uh, virtual card piece, I mean, you, you have to have the integrated payables product to use vCard. So you can't just vCard stand alone on its own. Okay. Uh, but, the, you know, the other caveat is, again, your vendor has to be a merchant to accept credit cards. So that could be the probably the barrier at some point. Now, again, in the world we're in now, more and more businesses are going to merchant and using credit cards. That's becoming more commonplace than it was years ago. So that's probably the biggest barrier. Okay. And thanks for raising that again. And and the, and I'd like to spend a little bit of time on, on that theme or topic, which is... Um, Anything my suppliers or vendors need to do to prepare or accept uh, virtual card payments uh, or or any of the payment types that we've been talking about, and I know there's a term that describes, particularly again in the con in the context of uh, virtual cards. But how do you how do you determine whether a vendor or a supplier can accept virtual payments? Yeah, there's a couple of ways. So when a vendor match is run with a client's payables file, um, some of them are already enrolled in that network, if you will. So they're already on the list with Visa, MasterCard that they are able to accept. So then it's an easy match. You know that they're going to accept it. Ones that aren't already enrolled in that, um, they have the opportunity to do so with, um, it's kind of a campaign that where they can, um, reach out to their vendors and see if they are able and willing to accept that type of payment. Okay. Got it. So just because Marley, to your point, if they're not on this uh, list that Visa or MasterCard would have that says, okay, we know for a fact this company accepts card, even if they're not on that type of a registry or list, um, you can still explore that possibility with them and convey here's why it may be advantageous for them to accept a virtual card payment uh, from a company. Yes, and from what I've heard, it's very um, it's a very easy process as well for them. They make it so it's not cumbersome and that they're able to kind of um, go in and click and kind of accept. Um, but one thing along with that is that um, so just because they're not enrolled now doesn't mean that they're not willing to accept it. Just with Kim mentioned the world we're living in and um, kind of payments being received via mail. Um, some clients are looking at they really want to get paid quicker. Um, some vendors, I should say. Um, so they know that it's advantageous for them um, to get paid via virtual card because they know they'll get paid quicker on time, more efficient. Um, so for them, it's cash flow. Okay, got it. You know, and it, it's almost feeling to me like uh, this could be the uh, uh, the beginning of uh, yet another podcast, which would be to focus maybe even more uh, narrowly on virtual cards and some of the things that uh, we've touched on in uh, in our time together so far uh, around supplier enablement and evaluating. Uh, that payment type and what the advantages are uh, in terms of accepting uh, a virtual card payment. So uh, let's let's sort of keep that in mind. Um, beyond that, um, what else have either of you heard from clients or prospects about things to keep in mind when moving forward or considering uh, integrated payables? Probably the biggest thing is the file, the file import from the ERP system. That's probably where we would start because that's the biggest component of for the whole process to work is in order to create that single single file with all those modules in it. Uh, so I'd say that's probably the first and foremost where we would start. And that's my opinion anyway, Marley. Yeah, I just think there's a lot of excitement around it. Um, I know this has been kind of a struggle for some, um, some businesses to really uh, manage all these different types of payments and they've already tried on their end to kind of move some over and it's just it it seems like kind of a difficult task where this is a kind of a dedicated process that um, you know to kind of get it all pull it all in together and try to um, you know convert these and have them uh, going 
certain channels that they want or that they they don't have to worry about it as much because they can stop writing checks on their end since um, this process would do it for you. So, and one more comment on that, uh, I'd like to add that Marley mentioned earlier when she talked about the vendor match. So that's something that we will do for the client. So it's not work that the client's going to have to do. They'll provide us a list of their, you know, the the vendors that they're paying, and then we do the work behind the scenes to do that vendor match. So, um, so it's a win-win for the client. They're not having to do that work. Uh, that that's a really thank you, Kim, for bringing that uh, forward as well, because I, I do think that that's a really uh, critical part of the execution of this. I can imagine that a lot of folks who are listening to this podcast are going to say, you know what, you've got my attention and let's really start to talk about practically how do we get this going and how much, and, and it seems pretty complex. So how can I figure all this out? And what both of you are touching on here is this is where, whether it's First Business Bank or another financial uh, uh, institution, but hopefully First Business Bank, here's how we can help you navigate these different elements and make it happen and inform and educate you and take on a lot of that work uh, here with us, our team. Um, and that's, that's huge because in the meantime, I can appreciate that a controller or a treasurer at a company, the accounting team, They've got a number of things that they need to pay attention to uh, just day to day, uh, but we can really help out by taking on, uh, A, helping them evaluate the potential, and then B, laying out a project plan or a, a work plan that will say, okay, here are the things that uh, the treasury management team at First Business Bank, as an example, can take on uh, to get this up and running. Um, so I think that that's, that's a very, very important aspect. Uh, of uh, of how to start down this path and make it happen. Um, anything else that we haven't talked through this afternoon, Marley, from your point of view, or Kim, from your point of view, that a company should be thinking about or considering or uh, needing to understand before uh, taking the next step? Well, I kind of wanted to mention, just talking about that, like Kim said, we do the work on our end. And it's actually really cool once you get that analysis back. Um, there's a lot of detail in there and we help walk through it. And it's just, it's it's a lot of good information to see um, kind of that, that payables file that is provided from our clients. Um, but again, we do the analysis and it's, it's all laid out for them. So it's it's almost a fun process, I'll say, um, for the client to see and even for us to see as well um, of those. And again, you can kind of plug and play in there and also see what percentages, oh, these ones are already kind of guaranteed can go over to virtual card, this is, um, ACH, and then um, these would still potentially remain as check. Um, so I think... That might sound kind of nerdy, but it's it's really cool to see it. I think clients are really interested in it and they see a lot of value. And again, all it takes is um, for them to kind of pull their current vendor list of who the, who they're paying and um, go from there. Yeah, a little yeah, investment I, yeah. time. A little investment yeah, for time sure. is all we're asking. Yeah, and it's like a puzzle, Marley. I, I like the way you described it and your enthusiasm for it, right? And um it's this idea that it doesn't have to be, I think that's something else that I believe is true is that it doesn't have to be an all or nothing thing. You can begin this process, do that, uh, you know, get that uh, AP file, for example, look at who they're working with today, uh, start to understand the current distribution of payments among those various types, and then understand, okay, if we shifted, and maybe it begins if if virtual card feels a little too daunting to start with, there's still that opportunity to migrate from check to ACH and you're already part of the way there. So I think it starts off again with that discovery process and then some recommendations. And then we're here to help uh, the execution of that process, but it doesn't have to be 100% from day one moving from the way they're doing it today to a full-blown uh, integrated payable solution. Anything else, any other words of wisdom from the two of you on the solution, the approach, et cetera? 
No, it's fun having a new tool in the toolbox in the treasury team. So uh, again, we'd love to chat with anyone that just has an interest in learning more about it. Sounds good. And and um, I was at a conference recently, and one of the things we were talking about is that um, challenges in the workforce, finding talent, uh, labor challenges, shortages. There's a lot of conversation today on that front, and oftentimes it's in the context of automation on the shop floor or the factory floor. But what I like about what we've talked through today and what each of you have shared is that this really is automation in the office uh, area or the treasury function. And there are many gains to be had uh, with uh, with proper support and advice from your bank uh, to move in that direction. So I think it's, it's a very timely uh, topic as well. So with that, I, I'd like to thank Marley and Kim for participating in our conversation, sharing their insights and their experiences and expertise. And I'd like to thank our audience for listening today as well. And in future uh, episodes, we'll go into more detail about additional treasury management solutions that can be used uh, in your business to optimize working capital uh, management, uh, generate revenue, as we've talked about today, uh, protect against fraud, just become more efficient overall, uh, and potentially by offering customers uh, of companies that we serve more ways to pay. Uh, that could actually also attract new clients to businesses that we serve. So that's another topic that I think uh, we can explore uh, down the road here. And finally, be sure to visit us at firstbusiness.bank to check out other resources we offer to businesses, business owners, and leaders to help them succeed and achieve the goals that they have. And we invite you to experience the advantage with First Business Bank. Thank you. If you want more content like what you just heard delivered straight to your inbox, go to firstbusinessbankpodcast.com. And if you haven't already, make sure to subscribe to the First Business Bank Podcast wherever you listen to podcasts. If you're listening on Apple Podcasts, please leave a quick rating of the show. Thanks so much for listening. First Business Bank, member FDIC.